Hey everyone, thanks for coming. I hope you can hear me well. Okay, so this lecture is going to be about the technological and conceptual changes happened in Riskified in the past year in the MLOps field and about the path we're walking towards enabling and supporting multiple machine learning models in production efficiently. So we're going to see how we solved one of the major problems that exist today in the MLOps world. And about the agenda, we will start with a little bit about what is Riskify, then we're going to talk about the trade-off between working with one model in contrast to multiple models. Then we will see some high-level introduction to what is MLOps in general, and in particular, we're going to see some machine learning pipeline solution. And this one will lead us towards the Riskify point of view to the solution, some obviously airflow-based internal service that we developed. We're going to see the goals that we started with some obstacles we faced along the way, and eventually we will end up with the solutions as well. My name is Zoe Perry. I'm a machine learning engineer in Riskified in the past six months, and my email address is listed down the slide in case you will have some further questions in the end. Great. So a couple of thoughts about Riskified. So Riskified enables merchants to maximize their e-commerce potential by using both AI and big data in order to tackle credit card frauds and some other optimizations in the online shopping process. And nowadays, around $89 billion of, dollars of deals for merchants all around the world are passing through our system in a year. And these are super both exciting and challenging days for us. Okay, so let's look on where we were one year ago. So back then, an end-to-end -end, uh, training of a model took us 14 days, which include all the manual integration of the different components that construct a training pipeline. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and obviously the research aspect of the training pipeline itself, including the analytical tests. And now let's multiply it by 25 models we have in production. And we will reach out that it took us more than one year to do retrain to all of our models. So this is the really non-scalable starting point we faced one year ago. But before we we'll jump into the solution of that, let's raise the question of why we want to support 25 models. Why we cannot just say that we in Riskify are going to supply one model to all of our customers and work only with that. So over the next two slides, we're going to see the trade-off between these two approaches. And we're going to see the concept post uh, of both of them. And also, we're going to understand why in Riskify we cannot settle down with one model only eventually. So let's start with the first solution, the single model approach. So the advantages in this case is the smaller engineering effort that exists if you are working with one model only, that we have a bigger data set to train with, and that we don't really have the cold start problem as basically we will never really start from scratch for new customers. On the other hand, the disadvantages in this case it's usually we will have low performance when we try to generalize one model to all of our customers, as basically we cannot really assume that the data will be distributed similarly between the different data sets or different customers in this case. And it is much harder to monitor and to optimize the different KPIs of our customers in case we are working with one model. So in Riskified, given a CNP deal where CNP stands for card not present, we should answer the question whether this deal is legitimate or not while we are taking the liability on this deal. That means that if we are getting a deal and we approve it and eventually it turns out to be fraud, we're going to pay for it. Obviously, we cannot just throw away all of our deals by marking them as fraud. We have some minimal approval weight we should hold. And this approval weight and the general request we are getting are different between our customers. And hence, in this one model solution, it is much harder to monitor and optimize the different KPIs. Let's move on and let's continue with the multiple model solution. So actually, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to work with exactly one model per client. We might have big customers that uh, requires more than one model, and we, have, we might have models that will be used by multiple small but with similar characteristic clients. Anyway, this entire solution or approach is talking about the management of multiple models in parallel. And let's see the advantages in this case. So usually we will have better performance when we are working with multiple models and it is much easier to fit and optimize the customer's KPIs. 
before reaching to the disadvantages. So as you probably understood already, both from the headline of the lecture and from what I said in previous slide, we didn't really have other option in Riskified, and we could not settle down with one model only. And this is the approach that we chose. And we today working with a lot, a lot of models uh, simultaneously in production. So it is important to emphasize uh, what are the disadvantages in this case. And it's starting with the heavy costs that exist in case you are working with multiple models. Uh, the cold start problem that we avoided in the one model solution. It is much harder to train four small customers as the data set is smaller. And on top of all of that, and what was actually the trigger to both this journey that we started one year ago and to this lecture, is the heavy engineering effort that exists in the case that we are working with multiple models. And we are starting from here, and let's see the steps that we took in order to overcome this difficulty. Great. So in the next slide, I'm going to see what is machine learning pipeline solution and how it is related to the MLOps world. But first, we're going to see some really quick high-level overview on what is MLOps in general and what are the different phases that exist in the MLOps world. So it is common today to divide the MLOps world into three phases, which comes to describe both the MLOps and automation levels around the management of machine learning models in production. So we're starting with MLOps level zero, which includes manual building and training and validation and zero tracking for the training process. We have MLOps level one, which is talking about an automated machine learning pipeline, a one centralized place that is gathering all the information and artifacts from the training process and our, the ability to reproduce our runs. And MLOps level two, which, is, which includes the, the ability of exploration of new features, new models, and new capabilities in general, and includes the CI CD CT process inside. So just really in one sentence, in the aspect of machine learning pipeline, so the CI or continuous integration process is includes the building of the pipeline components code and running automatic tests. The CD or continuous deployment includes the automatic deployment of the pipeline of the CI pipeline components and artifacts into some target environment. And the CTO continuous training is actually the auto-identification of events that requires the retraining of the model and followed by automatic deployment of the trained model into, uh, into production. Uh, in particular, regarding the CT, we're going to dive a little bit more very soon. Great. So, in order for us to understand what is machine learning pipeline, we should start with its smallest units. These units or building blocks are actually the components that construct the pipeline itself. And the most important attribute is that one, they are containerized. That means that there are some individual entity which can run on its own. And two, that are composable, which is a super important attribute for the component themselves in order for the pipeline to be flexible eventually for its end users. Great, so a quick zoom out and let's look on the pipeline itself. So the most important attribute of the pipeline is consistency. We want to make sure that we're using the exact same pipeline in both offline and online phases in order for the work being done during research will be in the exact same environment like the production environment. And in order for the production environment to be able to successfully reproduce the results we got during research phase. Great. So we saw the pipeline, and over the next few slides, we're going to see four components that are coming on top of this pipeline, and they are actually an integral part of the entire solution. So let's start with the first one. First one is feature store. So feature store is actually the place that is connecting between the model and the raw data. This is the place that holds the features definitions and their context and the way how we should calculate them. And the most important attribute of the feature store is consistency as well, as we want to make sure that features in runtime in online are calculated in the exact same manner as we calculate them during research phase. Great. Second component, experiment manager. So we are talking about an automated pipeline. The amount of runs that we have is going rapidly, and we have to have one place that is gathering all the information and artifacts from the training process into one place. And here comes the experiment manager. He also the one that supplies us visibility, for example, some plot of the model convergence or some metric performance plots. And also the experiment manager, probably the most important attribute is the 
ability to compare between different runs. Okay, sometimes we want to take two runs that are similar, but with some small tweak between them. Let's say, let's say for example, that we are taking two runs of the same model, but with some different parameters of how to choose our samples for the training set. So here comes the experiment manager and is the one that enables us to do this comparison between different ones. Great, third component, model registry. So actually not only that we are maintaining multiple models in general, but we also have to maintain multiple versions for, for, it, for, for each model and the state of the art of each one of our customers. And the model registry is used during the model validation step as the place we should pull the benchmark model from. So we have an automated pipeline. We are running, uh, we are training our model, and we are getting to the point of the model validation that we want to test our new train model in contrast to some other model. So here comes the model registry. We can pull the benchmark model form and compare our new train model to the benchmark model. And this is being done both in offline and in online phases. And from the online environment point of view, the model registry is also the end of place between the retraining of the model and, and the online model server. Great. So fourth and last component is the event triggers, and it comes right after the model registry. So we talked about an automated pipeline. We talked that we have a new trained model. We can pull the benchmark model from the model registry and compare to our model. Let's assume that our model is doing a good job, and now we can deploy it to the online serving. Given uh, the fact that it's now in the online serving, we can pull classifications in runtime. And given these specifications or predictions in general, and given the model itself, we can track and monitor the model. Eventually, our goal is to answer the question whether we should retrain our model or not. So how can we answer that? With a set of tests that are also called event triggers. This test can check, for example, for some data drift. I mean, if the data that is coming in online is distributed differently than the data the model trained with, or tests that are checking if there is some degradation in the model performance, or even a check that just say like every X new data, we should retrain our model. So all of these tests can answer independently on the question whether we should retrain our model or not. And they are called event triggers, and they are the ones that actually are responsible to re-trigger this entire pipeline. And this is exactly the CT or continuous training process we mentioned earlier in the MLOps level two. Great, so we saw four components on top of this pipeline, but we didn't speak about the component or the entity that is actually responsible to run this pipeline. This workflow orchestrator is the one that is responsible for reproducibility, is the one that is responsible to supply the option to either debug or rerun in case of failures. And this entity, this workflow orchestrator, is also the one that keeps the data set that we use during our run, so which features we used, or even which code version we are using. So let's do a quick zoom out and see how all of these components are connected. Great, so there is some image I took from some article regarding MLOps, and you can see the dashed line in the middle coming to represent the difference or the separation between the offline and online phases. We can see here the feature store that we talked about its consistency that is using us for both offline and online. We can see the model registry that we can pull the benchmark model from then deploy our train model to the online serving, the experiment manager, the workflow orchestrator that is colored with some yellow background in order to emphasize that you are using the exact same pipeline in both online and offline, and the event triggers that are coming right after the model tracking, and they are actually the ones that are responsible to re-trigger this pipeline. So in order for all of these components to communicate and live together, and actually in order for also the model lifecycle that is written here in the left side of the slide to exist. We need those CI, CD, CT processes we mentioned earlier. And actually, they are the ones that uh, they are the enablers for this entire pipeline and this entire solution. And over the next few slides, we're going to see the riskified point of view to this solution. We're going to see how we adapted some MLOps ideas. We're going to introduce something that we are calling trainer as a service, which is an internal airflow based service that we developed based on MLOps ideas. And its main goal is to reduce the operational effort and to allow us actually to maintain a lot of models in a much larger scale. Great. So 
We are looking for a moment on the exact same pipeline again, but let's draw some red dashed line around it. And actually this line is here to represent for us and to emphasize the serving of this pipeline as a service. This service is being used in parallel by both engineers and researchers or someone from either the analytics or operational teams. And in practice, this service is the one that enables all of these teams to work and communicate together. And from now on, we're going to see the goals that we raised while starting the development of this service. Some obstacles, obviously, that we faced along the way. And as I promised in the beginning, we're going to end up with the solutions as well. Great. So let's start with the goals. First goal is to support multiple code languages. We didn't want that. We didn't want to limit ourselves to one programming language only. And this is an actual need we had in our research department. Second goal is to reduce researcher software effort. So we want to do as much as we can in order to let our researchers to focus on research only. And the third goal is that we wanted to build an infrastructure that will be both um, rapid, that will enable both rapid and um, accessible research. And doing that by an easy and on-demand building block replacement. And the fourth and last goal. So as any service, we assume that it's not one-time event, okay? We know that it will take us time to develop this service, and we want to make sure that we enable both the usage and the development uh, of this pipeline and this service by multiple users and developers uh, in parallel. We're going to understand a little bit more about this goal when we will reach to it by understanding the problem that we face behind it. So before jumping to the steps that we took in order to address these goals, let's uh, model our service or our pipeline with some tiny toy example. So obviously, we are using Airflow as a workflow orchestrator. As you probably know, a workflow in Airflow is a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, consists of multiple tasks, and we are running it on top of Kubernetes. In this toy example, so tasks 1, 0, 1, and 2 are going to run in parallel. Then the task name one after loop gonna run in simultaneously with the task also on this and eventually we're gonna end up with the task name one this last so let's start with the goals and see what we did in order to address them so the first goal that we mentioned is to that we wanted to support multiple coding languages <coughs> great so when we saw the components in the beginning of the slide we talked about that the main attribute is um, that they are containerized. I mean that there are some individual entity which can run on its own with some input Docker image. And by that, actually, not only that we don't really care about the code itself of the building block that is running, we also don't really care about the code language. And the building block itself can be either in R or Python or Scala. And from our service point of view, it is a, totally a black box. Uh, and the fact that we wanted to enable some uh, multiple coding languages is an actual need that we had in our research department. Great. Uh, second, do uh, second goal, uh, reduce researcher software effort. So, in, so when we started the development of this service, we took an extra care for software principles that we know that will allow us to build an infrastructure and service that will be flexible on one hand, but also uh, well-defined and production worthy on the other end. And one of the main principles that we focused on was automatic test. And the way to reach this goal was based on building building blocks that are well-defined and with a really clear inputs and output API. And by that, we earned twice. First, we controlled all the software design process. And <clears throat> secondly, by defining building blocks that are with clear API for both the entrance and exit, we can really easily add tests before and after each of the building blocks. So let's take, for example, the training building block. We can easily add tests before, tests, for example, that are checking that we are getting all the features that our model expects to get, test that is checking that there, are, that there aren't any features that the model doesn't recognize, even tests that check the feature validity. For example, I have some feature that is range of value supposed to be between minus one to one, so I'm not getting some weird five value, or even tests that is checking that the labels are distributed as I expected. Also, we can add very easily tests post the training building block, for example, to check our model convergence or check some metric performance. 
or even check that the feature importance that we got in the model eventually is as we expected. <coughs> Great. A third goal on demand building block replacement. So we assume that like we're going to have always going to have new research capabilities and we wanted to build a framework that will enable us the insertion and testing of new code as part of the pipeline to be as easy as possible. And using the fact that we build these building blocks with a really clear and uh, API for both inputs and outputs, it is really, really easy for our researchers today to just bring new code, replace existing tasks with their new code, and also test this pipeline, the actual production pipeline with their code on top of it. Great. So fourth and last goal, allow parallel development on the same pipeline. So let's understand this goal by trying to understand the problem behind it. So let's take, for example, that we have, one, we have two users. The first user want to try some new model to replace, to replace sorry, the model that we are currently using. And the second model, uh, the second user, sorry, wants to try some new code uh, that affecting the way that we are choosing the samples for our training data set. So in case we have one platform where everyone are touching the same platform in parallel, we're going to end up in a situation that both of the users are interfering one to the other. And not only that, actually the ground truth that they are seeing is not really the production pipeline, but also we might end up in a situation where the first user is getting some pretty good new results, but is not really aware to the fact that those results are due to the changes introduced by the second user. So how can we solve it? How can we let those user, users uh, use the same production pipeline with their code on top of it, but without interfering one to the other. We can also ask how we can keep those isolated environments for them. So let's understand the really the real how part, the real solution for that. So we have two users and they have their code. And in the bottom of the slide, we can see the DAG or the pipeline and eventually their end goal from the user point of view is for those tasks in the bottom to run with their code. And just so we, uh, to emphasize, like when I say their code, that means taking production code with and only with their code on top of that. So what we did, a user developed something on his local branch. When he finished its development, he pushes it to some non-main branch. And we configured our CI workflow such that for every push to the CI workflow, regardless of the main or dev branch, we're going to create some new and unique Docker image. And we built our DAGs such that they expect to get the Docker image they should run with. And actually, Airflow is the one that is responsible to distribute this image to the tasks of the DAG. So we're going to end up with the user that develop on his local branch, push to some non-man branch. Our CI workflow is building some unique Docker image, and now the user can just by one click trigger this pipeline or their service, supply its unique image that he got during the CI workflow, and then Airflow is the one responsible to distribute this image to the task below, and eventually we're going to end up that in a situation that both users can use the same pipeline to test this pipeline with their new code, with their new capabilities, but without interfering one to the other. <laughs> Great. Finally, let's see how this service is reflected in Riskify. Let's see the point of view of each uh, and any one of the relevant teams, starting with our lowest level user, the one that actually manipulate the pipeline itself, the building blocks inside it, uh, while maintaining the code versions of the service. Now let's switch to the point of view of a researcher in our department who sees this pipeline as an actual service who, which he can trigger by one click, actually we got into a situation where all a researcher that he needs to do is supply a very simple config YAML file. And by one click, he gets an end-to-end -end model training pipeline. And one more thing we uh, mentioned in the beginning that our service is flexible. So for example, if a user doesn't want the task also on this to one, so we can just say it when it triggers this service and he can just choose the task that he actually wants to run. 
last point of view, our highest level user, someone from either the analytics or operations teams, who sees this really as a service without really diving into the components inside. Great. Summarizing, so we saw how we adapted and used MLOps ideas uh, in the service that we developed, and actually we reduced significantly uh, the amount of operational effort around the management and monitoring and retraining of machine learning models in production. Some small advice from our team is like the changes between those MLOps phases we saw in the beginning is not something that can happen in a day and it's totally a gradual process. And our tech stack is listed in the bottom, starting with MLflow for open experiments and auto-logging. Obviously, Airflow, our workflow orchestrator, Docker and ECR for the images, Vault for the secrets, Spark, of course, and that's it. Thank you.